Welcome to the Inspirational Living Podcast. To gain access to the full transcripts of our more than 200 podcasts, please become our monthly patron for less than the price of your favorite latte. Learn more at livinghour.org forward slash patron. Today's reading was edited and adapted from The Use of Life by Sir John Lubbock, published in 1894. The most important thing to learn in life is how to live. There is nothing people are so anxious to keep as life, and nothing they take so little pains to keep well. This is no simple matter. Life is short, art is long, opportunity fleeting, experience uncertain, and judgment difficult, says Hippocrates. Happiness and success in life do not depend on our circumstances, but on ourselves. More people have ruined themselves than have ever been destroyed by others. More houses and cities have perished at the hands of men than storms or earthquakes have ever destroyed. There are two sorts of ruin. One is the work of time, the other of humankind. Of all ruins, the ruins of humanity are the saddest and our worst enemy, as Seneca said, is the one in our breast. Providence does not create evil, but gives liberty, and if we misuse it we are sure to suffer, but have only ourselves to blame. I am sometimes accused of being optimistic but I have never ignored or denied the troubles and sorrows of life. I have never said that we all are happy, only that we might be so, and that if we aren't, the fault is generally our own, that most of us throw away more happiness than we enjoy, and this makes it all the more melancholy. In other words, for of all sad words of tongue or pen, the saddest are these, it might have been. In many cases, what we call evil is good misapplied, or carried to excess. A wheel, or even a cog out of place, throws the whole machinery out of gear, and if we place ourselves out of harmony with the constitution of the universe, we must expect to suffer accordingly. Courage in excess becomes foolhardiness, affection weakness, thrift, avarice. The Persians attributed happiness to the spirit of good, and misfortune to the demon of evil. But in reality we bring the troubles of life on ourselves by our own errors. Errors in both senses, by doing what we know all the time to be wrong, but also, and perhaps almost as much, by our own mistakes. What we teach ourselves becomes much more a part of our being than what we learn from others. Education does not end when we leave school. It has indeed scarcely begun. It goes on through life. How well it would be, said Seneca, if we would but exercise our brains as we do our bodies and take as much pains for virtue as we do for pleasure. Some people are indeed fatalists. Everything in their view is ordained, and what will happen must happen, whether they will it or not. Humankind they regard as an automaton, the mere plaything of a superior power. The first point then to be considered is whether there is or is not a science of life. Can we steer our ship over the ocean of time, or are we condemned to drift? We are what we are, 
and master of our fate. For if we are not, the fault lies at our own door. What you wish to be, that you are. For such is the force of your will, joined to the supreme, that whatever you wish to be, seriously and with a true intention, that you will become. If then we have this power over our destiny, it becomes of the utmost importance to ask ourselves what we wish to be, and how we can make the most of the rich estate of life. Some people have a purpose in life, and some have none. Our first object should be to make the most and best of ourselves. We must not, however, attempt this merely with a selfish object, for we are foredoomed to failure. No person's private fortune can be an end in itself, any way worthy of their existence. The best and greatest minds, Plato and Aristotle, Buddha and St. Paul, would never have been content to perfect themselves merely for themselves. I will assume then that what we are to do is make the best of ourselves for the sake of others. And let me at once point out what an interesting task we have in that case set before us. To offer advice has proved a somewhat thankless task from since time began. My object then is to make some suggestions to those who wish to be and to do something to make the most of themselves and their lives. It is sad indeed to see how many people waste their opportunities, how many could be made happy with the blessings which are recklessly wasted or thrown away. Take care that your pleasures are real and not imaginary. We do many things because they are called pleasure, which we should hate if they went by any other name. Many people think that they are having pleasure merely because they are not working. Others seem to use the word as if it applied only to the senses, while on the contrary, the pleasures of the mind are both more exquisite and more lasting. We neglect or recklessly injure the only body we have, and on the health of which the mind so greatly depends. We do not derive half the enjoyment we might from works of art that are a national treasure. We do not enjoy the beauties of the earth on which we live, or of the sky over our heads. We make perhaps more of music though much less than we might. We boast that, while animals have instinct only, we are a reasoning being, and yet how little our boasted intellect has added to the happiness of humankind. It might even be asserted that, on the whole, the possession of a mind has been a source of suffering rather than of enjoyment. Animals do not distress themselves, and we do. We torment ourselves with doubts and fears, cares and anxieties. Mystery encompasses us on all sides, but we must not be impatient with it. And though we need not be anxious, we must be on our guard. We must be watchful even in matters where we fancy ourselves least liable to make a mistake. There is, I believe, says Lord Chesterfield, more judgment required for the proper conduct of our virtues than for avoiding their opposite vices. Vice in its true light is so deformed that it shocks us at first sight and would hardly ever seduce us if it did not, at first, wear the mask of some virtue. We have all met persons who, with much that is good, have allowed themselves to be seduced into uncharitableness and hardness of heart, 
And if we turn from the individual to the human race, is not the neglect of our advantages even more startling? Humanity may still confess with Newton that we are but as children playing on the seashore and gathering here and there a prettier shell or a more delicate seaweed than usual, while the great ocean of life lies all undiscovered before us. There is no single substance, the full uses and properties of which are yet known to us. We labor from morning to night, and yet if we could but avail ourselves more fully of the properties of matter and the forces of nature, it is probable that an hour or two would fully supply all our bodily and reasonable wants, and leave us ample time for the cultivation of the mind and the affections. To be virtuous you must be a person of character, and to be virtuous is to be truly free. Vice is the real slavery. A particular course of conduct does not degrade because it is wrong. It is wrong because it degrades. If by some extraordinary subversion of morals, wrong became right, it would still be fatal to happiness and peace of mind. I will not quote any theologian in support of the thesis that sin and sorrow are inseparable but on such a point will rather rely on the evidence, once again, of the eminent Lord Chesterfield, who in one of his letters to his son after some other wise advice, concludes by saying, Such are the rewards that always crown virtue, and such the characters that you should imitate if you would be a great and good man which is the only way to be a happy one. Descartes embodies his rules for a practical life in three maxims. One, to act on all those occasions which call for action promptly and according to the best of our judgment, and to abide the result without discontent. Two, to seek happiness in limiting our desires, rather than in attempting to satisfy them. And third, to make the search after truth the business of your life. It isn't only the thoughtless, the selfish, the wicked, who in the unscrupulous pursuit of what they suppose to be their own interests, make both themselves and others miserable. It must be admitted that many worthy people and many good books, with no doubt the best intentions, fall into what is in essence a very similar error. They have represented a life of sin as a life of pleasure. They have pictured virtue as self-sacrifice, austerity as religion. The Inquisition was of course an extreme case. Many of the Inquisitors were, I doubt not, excellent people, kind and even merciful in their nature but they entirely mistook the very essence of Christianity. Even in everyday life we meet worthy people who seem to think that whatever is pleasant must be wrong, that the true spirit of religion is crabbed, sour and gloomy, that the bright, sunny, radiant nature which surrounds us is an evil a temptation devised by the spirit of evil, and not one of the greatest delights showered on us in such profusion by the Creator. Many people distress and torment themselves about the mystery of existence, yet the riddle of the world is understood only by those who feel that God is good. There is no duty, said Seneca, the fulfillment of which will not make us happier nor any temptation for which there is no remedy. Accuse not nature, says Milton, she has done her part. Do thou but thine. We may be sure that the Creator would not have made all nature beauty to the eye, 
and music to the ear if we had not been men to enjoy it thoroughly. And it is almost impossible to estimate what peace a person brings to others and what joy to themselves by managing their life rightly. If this age be, as in many respects I think it is, the most wonderful, interesting, and enlightened the world has ever seen, that is our good fortune, not our own doing. It is something not to be proud of, but to be thankful for. But while we should be grateful, and enjoy to the full the innumerable blessings of life, we cannot expect to have no sorrows or anxieties. Life has been described by Robert Walpole as a comedy to those who think, a tragedy to those who feel. It is indeed a tragedy at times, and a comedy very often. But as a rule, it is what we choose to make it. The Inspirational Living Podcast is a production of The Living Hour and brought to you by the generous financial support of our patrons. Become our patron for as little as $3 a month to gain access to free transcripts and the series Our Sunday Talks, which features thought-provoking readings on spirituality and spiritual growth. Thanks for listening. I look forward to talking with you next time.